What is going on everyone? My name is NZ Shade, and welcome to Game Dev Adventures. And more importantly today, more importantly than welcoming you guys to Game Dev Adventures, welcome to Baldur's Gate 3. Honestly, this is one of these games that I would not have been surprised if we never saw it. This is very much a Half-Life 3 type of game, where everybody wanted it, everybody was talking about it, but it just seemed like the pieces weren't going to fall into place. It's been about 20 years since Baldur's Gate 2, and I think that everyone's just happy it's back. You know, like, whatever this game ends up being, however this game ends up going down in terms of how we remember it, or how good it was, or, or whatever, right? Just the fact that we're getting a Baldur's Gate 3, and we've got sort of the entire CRPG landscape all the way back. People have faith in it again. People are playing the games. It's just exciting. So, today, I want to talk about the combat in Baldur's Gate 3. Because, if you're familiar with the first two games, the gameplay from Baldur's Gate 1 and 2 was actually very similar. They used basically the, sim the same engine, the same... Uh, rule set, the same Dungeons and Dragons rule set, and they essentially played the same. You obviously had more powerful characters in Baldur's Gate 2, but you were playing with the same system, just at a higher level. But all of that has, has gone out the window here. We are playing an entirely new game, an entirely different system. The differences between Baldur's Gate 2 and Baldur's Gate 3 may actually surprise you if you haven't been keeping up with sort of the changes to the CRPG landscape. And, you know, changes are always complicated, right? And some people, I think, are going to be disappointed with them. But I also think that they're awesome. I think that the changes are really cool here, and some people are going to be really happy with them. So essentially, what I want to do in this video, I guess I want to do two things. So I'm going to split this into two parts. I want to talk about the games that influence Baldur's Gate 3, to help people understand why the changes are the way that they are and where they're coming from, right? I mean, there's been a lot that's happened to CRPGs in the past 20 years since Baldur's Gate 2, and effectively, Baldur's Gate 3 reflects those changes, right? The changes that we're seeing here are not coming out of thin air. These are things that, if you have been playing all the games in the genre as they've come out, you are familiar with and you might understand where they're coming from. But if you are sort of a Baldur's Gate long fan that just was played Baldur's Gate and is coming into it, let me just kind of catch you up to speed on what's been going on and why the game kind of is what it is. So first, we're going to talk about the games that influence Baldur's Gate 3 and sort of why that is the way it is. In the second part, I'm going to go into the game itself, analyze some of the fights, and talk about some of the mechanics that I like, some of the ones that I think are interesting, some of the ones that I think might be a little bit at odds with themselves, and maybe just some other small changes that they could make to just make things smoother and easier. So, we could obviously spend all week talking about every RPG that has influenced Baldur's Gate 3. Uh, there's a lot of them. Um, but essentially, I think that the three most important ones to focus on are the original Baldur's Gate games, Baldur's Gate 1 and 2, Dungeons and Dragons, the just classic tabletop RPG D&D. &D. And then, this one might surprise you, Divinity Original Sin 1 and 2. And I'll get into why this game is so heavily influenced by Divinity a little bit later on. But let's start with Baldur's Gate 1 and 2. These games had real-time battles where the player would pause and unpause the action. So you would watch the battle play out in real time, and then you would pause the game, give out orders to your units, and unpause to see it all unfold. And this was the standard for games of the late 90s. Pretty much all of the big games, including of course Baldur's Gate, of that era used the system. And at the time, this was just a really exciting, cool way to see battles play out. Because beforehand, there really hadn't been any way of doing big real-time battles and having it so well animated and really just look so cool, right? I mean, we had had stuff on the PC before, most of which had been turn-based, but nothing that had looked so grand and epic as the stuff in Baldur's Gate 1 and 2, which, of course, doesn't look so amazing now, but at the time it was really cool. And then, of course, the other thing we had were the tabletop games like D&D, &D, and obviously those weren't playing out in real time. And 
this was something that felt like the cutting edge. It was the new way of doing things, it was the exciting way of doing things, it felt modern, and it felt new. And that's why it dominated that late 90s era. However, over the years, I think that people have realized that for party-based RPGs, this real-time with pause system has some problems, and it has lost a lot of popularity. Pausing and unpausing combat is kind of clunky, and the novelty has worn off. When you pause and unpause the game all the time, you're really not actually watching it in real time. You're kind of just playing a turn-based game where you're sort of doing little snippets in real time, but it's not like you actually have the excitement factor of watching this big real-time battle. And it also comes with its own problems that, you know, the novelty of watching a battle in real time no longer really covers, right? A lot of times, because things are happening all simultaneously, it is not always clear what's happening in terms of different spells, casting, and different things, you know, procking and, and hitting each other. So you'll have a guy who's doing an action, and then he'll end up getting stunned right before his action goes off. And it's always not clear, you know, okay, is this happening before that, or is that happening before this? And obviously there's a log, you can look up exactly what happens, but making plans in that type of environment can be really tough. So in the Kickstarter era that we're sort of in the post-2010 world, um, most of the games that were really pushing the boundaries of CRPGs went back to a turn-based system. So we had the Shadowrun series, Wasteland 2, and the Divinity series. Now, some games use the real-time system, of course. It's not like this just completely vanished. Games like Pillars of Eternity and Pathfinder Kingmaker but these games felt more like a throwback to Baldur's Gate. They were trying to recreate that atmosphere and that excitement from that era, and they really weren't doing anything new or anything groundbreaking, right? The games that were doing the really cool and exciting stuff were generally going back to a turn-based system. So when it comes to Baldur's Gate 3, they have to make a decision, right? Are we gonna go back to turn-based and either sort of make this a throwback or try to really push that mechanic forward? Or are we just going to go with what seems to be the new exciting path, which is actually to go back to turn-based? And so they made the decision to go back to turn-based, which I think makes a lot of sense. Um, obviously, you know, people are going to be uh, unsure about this. I think that for people who want that classic Baldur's Gate feel, I would suggest a game like Pathfinder Kingmaker. Um, that's a really good one. But Baldur's Gate 3 wants to move in more of a forward direction, and so that's why I think they're going with the turn-based. All right, let's get into Dungeons and Dragons. So a quick disclaimer before we start here, I am definitely not a Dungeons and Dragons expert. I've played like a couple of campaigns, but you know, I was always that friend that you drag along that doesn't actually know what's going on. And I don't really understand Dungeons and Dragons. So if you do want more of a D&D perspective on this game, I would go elsewhere, but I have done a bit of research. I'm not coming into this completely cold. I have learned quite a bit about D&D and how it's developed, so I think that I have enough to talk about it at a basic level right here. So, Baldur's Gate has always been a direct implementation of D&D. Now, what I mean by that is it's not inspired by D&D, it's not, like, slightly based on D&D, it's taking the Dungeons & Dragons rule set and directly transcribing them into video game form. And a lot has changed in D&D since the year 2000, right? There have been new versions, new releases, you know, whole new generations playing, you know, entirely new changes to the storylines, the formula, everything. It's it's all different. So Baldur's Gate 1 and 2 used 2nd edition, and Baldur's Gate 3 uses 5th edition. So a lot of the changes that you see in the game are not necessarily even changes that they made willingly from the Baldur's Gate games previously, they're just changes that we've seen over three entire editions of Dungeons & Dragons. Um, so let me give you an example. So in Baldur's Gate 1, spellcasters started with one or two spells, right? If you had a specialized mage that specialized in a certain school of magic, you would start with two spells. And if you had a generic mage, you would start with one spell. <laughs> now, in Baldur's Gate 3, spellcasters start with nine spells. You have three cantrips and six regular spells. And if you don't understand what that is, that's okay. That's just D&D stuff, and you will figure it out very soon. And this makes the game a lot more complicated, obviously. 
And the thing to keep in mind is that Dungeons & Dragons is not actually a game that's designed for video games, right? It's designed for a tabletop experience where you're only going to be playing one character and you have other people around you to play the rest of the cast. Um, so in that situation, playing a character with nine spells would make sense because you only really have to think about one character and you can very quickly sort of learn and wrap your head around everything your character can do. But in Baldur's Gate 3, assuming that you're playing solo, um, you're going to be playing four characters at the same time. And, you know, this has obviously upsides and downsides. It can be uh, very deep. It can give the game a lot of depth. But it can also be pretty overwhelming. And uh, that complexity doesn't really seem to slow down. Uh, I have a bunch of level 3 characters, because that's where I'm at in the game. And my spellcasters have, like, 15 spells. So it's, like, it's not like you get 9 spells and then you're done. You are going to be collecting a lot more as you go. So this definitely encourages people to play slow and really learn their party but essentially you know this sort of example i mean it's just an example right there's lots of stuff that D and the fifth edition changes um bring to the game a lot of the changes here are coming from dungeons and dragons and the fact that D, &D is based around you know a party-based setting it's based on a tabletop setting sometimes they do seem to clash a little bit because it's a video game setting it's very different so that's a thing to keep in mind Last but not least, we have Divinity. The developers of Baldur's Gate 3, Larian, were also the ones that developed the Divinity games. And it was actually the Divinity games that convinced Wizards of the Coast to give the Baldur's Gate license to Larian. The game is also developed on the same engine as Divinity. So if you've played both games, the similarities between Baldur's Gate 3 and Divinity Original Sin 2 are pretty obvious. So. Divinity was based around these crazy elemental combos. You would create a pool of fire and then make a rain cloud to have it rain over the battlefields. And then the rain and fire would create a steam cloud. And then you would electrocute the steam cloud. And there was all sorts of things that you could do. Now, these mechanics all still seem to be there, but they definitely aren't as important. Divinity was built around these mechanics, and every single spell that you would cast would contribute in some way to the elemental chaos going on on the battlefield. But Dungeons & Dragons isn't really designed for these interactions. So a lot of the classic D&D spells, like Magic Missile, don't really interact or, you know, create these uh, sort of combinations. So what Larian's done is they've introduced new mechanics to allow them to keep working with sort of the environmental stuff that they like to do. And one of the big important ones is the ability to dip your weapon in a surface to add damage. So if you're playing a sword fighter character and you see a big pool of flames over to the side, you can run over to it, dip your sword in the flames, you know, get a big flaming sword, and then your sword attacks will do extra fire damage. And this is sort of Larian's way of introducing the type of mechanics that they like working with into a Dungeons & Dragons environment where they can't do the same things they did in Divinity. There are also just a bunch of other things that are the same as Divinity. Sort of small things that you'll notice if you play both games just because it runs on the same engine. So the movement system is basically the same. If you play Divinity, you remember how you could kind of move based on meters and sort of move in any direction as long as you have uh, the points for it. And in this game, the actual rules of when you're allowed to move are based on Dungeons and Dragons, but the actual mechanics of moving around and pathing and all that stuff are based on the same mechanics. The sightline system is also basically the same. So are you in line to be able to shoot an arrow at an enemy? Is vision obscured? Uh, can you shoot through a window, right? Like how are you able to shoot around different obstacles and stuff? So these are just a few examples, but if you're familiar with both games, you're going to see these influences everywhere. And these influences also go beyond combat, right? You're going to see it in the camera, and you're going to see it in the way that platforms stack on top of each other, and the lighting, and all sorts of things, right? This very much is a game that is based on the same technology, and so you're going to see a lot of similarities between the two. And that's going to wrap it up for part one. Thank you guys for sticking around to the end. I will see you soon for part two, where we dive into some actual fights and analyze more of the nitty gritty of the game. But until then, I have been NZ Shade, 
Thank you for watching, and I'll see you soon.